Genesis chapter 39, we've been looking at the life of Joseph. Joseph is often known for his coat of many colors. Joseph is known for his time that he spent in Egypt as second in command to the Pharaoh. Joseph was a tremendous leader, a, a, a tremendous uh, a savior to the children of Israel in that he brought food to them. But we've been looking at the fact that throughout Joseph's life, Joseph remained faithful. Joseph said, I believe God, that's our theme for this year, in spite of some things. In spite of some awful circumstances. In spite of some tremendously hard, trying tragedies in his life. Joseph, in spite of these things, still chose to believe God. I think that's important because all of us face in spite of circumstances in our life. All of us have times of tragedy, times of disappointment, times of rejection, times of circumstances that we, quite frankly, would choose to be different. All of us would say about certain things in our life or lives, you know what? If I was in charge, I would not go through this. I would not deal with this. I would not walk through this. I would not journey through this. This morning in Genesis chapter 39, we now get to the part where Joseph ends up in Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful country during this time. The Pharaoh was the most powerful individual during this time, and that's where Joseph ends up. If you would look in your Bibles in Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse number 1, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and the, that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him. And he made him an overseer over his house and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him an overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Lord, I thank you for this time. I want to thank you for those who could join us this morning. Lord, for these brief moments we have together to look at your word, I pray that you would help me as I speak to clearly articulate the truths from your word. But Lord, more than that, I pray that you touch our hearts. I don't know all the circumstances of the people here this morning, Lord, but you do. Lord, I don't know all the background and all the potential hardship and tragedies that those are, people are facing, but you do. But Lord, I pray that we be challenged to still trust in you, to still believe in you in the face of a difficult situation. Lord, thank you for being such a gracious and wonderful God. We ask for your help during this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever gone the wrong direction? You ever made a wrong turn? Man, we're notorious for blazing our own trail, if you would. It's a good thing we didn't live back in the time when there were no roads out there. Hitch the horse to the wagon and let's just go. Where are you going, honey? Wherever we want to go. Honey, we're going in circles. That's not a circle. The earth is that small. Man, we blaze our trails, but let's be honest, we have gone wrong directions before uh, by our own choosing. A few years back, I was tasked with picking up a special speaker from the airport. A special speaker was coming in on a Tuesday night to, to come speak for our Tuesday night services, and he was coming in rather close. Our service starts at 7, and I think I had to be there right around 5.15 or 5.30, somewhere in there, about a half hour away, be here about 6 o'clock, and and the service just a few minutes later. I got to the airport like I was supposed to do. I was out in front of the airport like I was supposed to be. And I promptly got a phone call that said, where are you? I'm out front. Most of all our speakers would fly into the Flint Bishop Airport. You know where this is going, don't you? This speaker was not at the Flint Bishop Airport, but I was. I was there early in my vehicle. This particular speaker and his wife decided to show up at the MBS airport. 
Now, from where our church is at, it's about 28 minutes to Flint. And from here to, to the Midland Bay City, MBS Airport, about 32 minutes. From the Flint to the Midland Airport, about an hour between the two. I was here, they were here, and there was no way on God's green earth that I would get there and here in time. I was in the wrong place. And it was no one's fault. I hate to say this. Am I still live right now? Am I still recorded right now? I'm not sure whose fault it was. I'll get back to you on that. No, it was my fault. I went to the wrong place. I read the wrong instruction. I went the wrong direction. Ah, what an idiot, right? Maybe you felt that before. Man, what a mistake. I just, I blew it. I blew it. But what happens when you end up in the wrong place and it's not your fault? What happens when you end up in the wrong location and you were doing everything within your power to be in the right location at the right time? I read this story about a lady, 67-year-old lady, not that her age matters, she was in Belgium. And she headed to pick up her friend at the Brussels train station and programmed that address into her GPS. The train station was a mere 90 miles away from her beginning point. At about an hour and a half by any given measurement. Sabine reported that she let her navigation system take over, shutting her mind off. Now, I remember the days years ago when they used those things called, what do they call them? Maps. Maps, that's right. That's right. And now we use that thing called Google. Google Maps. She shut off her mind and she said, I was so absent-minded, I just kept on putting my foot down. And it wasn't until she hit Croatia, a day later, that she realized that something was seriously wrong. She doesn't seem sure, she said, on how many countries she, uh, how many countries she passed through. I believe they said it was through four countries. She passed different signposts in French and in German. And she traveled, <laughs> she traveled when she was done, over 900 miles, stopping to fill her gas tank twice and to sleep for a few hours. The wrong place. Now I read that and I'm like, oh my word. At some point, would you not know that something is seriously wrong? But by her own admission, she shut her mind off and let GPS took over. I want to draw your attention, if I could, to Genesis chapter 39, just in verse number 1. And I want to, with the Lord's help, just maybe show us a little concept this morning. The Bible says, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard in Egypt, an Egyptian, brought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Twice in this verse, the Bible says he was brought down into Egypt. That is a location where Jacob and his 12 boys before Joseph was sold and his one daughter, before, before Joseph went there to Egypt, he was north of Egypt. The Bible is giving us a location. He was brought down to Egypt. But I believe there is a greater truth in this passage. You see, Joseph was sent by God in the wrong direction. This morning, I want you to think about this concept. What happens when God sends me in the wrong direction? Now, before you go in left field, let me tell you, the wrong direction is actually the right direction. But to Joseph... It looked like the wrong direction. And to you and to me, there are going to be times in our lives, there are going to be times with our circumstances, there's going to be times in situations that we feel that God has sent us 900 miles in the wrong direction. Lord, I think your GPS is broken. Lord, I've passed through three different languages, through four or five different countries, and I'm 900 miles from my destination. Lord, you have sent me, we feel like, in the wrong direction direction. You ever felt that way? How did I end up here? 
We know that sometimes we end up in circumstances because of our choices, but there are those times that God seems to send us in the wrong direction. Joseph was sent down to Egypt. Egypt wasn't where he was born. Egypt wasn't where his family was. Egypt wasn't where Joseph wanted to be. Joseph had no desire to be in Egypt. Joseph wanted to be back home with dad, stepmom, and brothers and sisters. That's where Joseph wanted to be. We know from Scripture that when Joseph's brothers sold him to these passing, uh, traveling, nomadic people, that Joseph pleaded with them. Joseph didn't want to be in Egypt. In a sense, Joseph felt like, God, you sent me in the wrong direction. And here I am. This morning, I want to challenge us on this thought when God seems to send us in the wrong direction. You see, Egypt, the place where Joseph was sent, felt like a place of finality. Felt like a place of finality. There are going to be times in our life where God puts us in a situation, sends us in a direction, asks us to be in a place, and we will feel like it is a place of finality. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 39, verse 1, that Potiphar bought Joseph. He had no more freedom in life. A time in that culture where this was acceptable. Joseph was bought and he now had no choice where to sleep, when to get up. Joseph had no choice what to do. His instructions came down from his master. Joseph no doubt felt like this was a place of finality. This felt like a place that it's never going to end. I can see no solution that seems to be good. I can see no happy ending. And see here in 2020, fellow people, citizens, we like happy endings. We like when this person, the good guy wins and the bad guy doesn't. We like happy endings. Have you ever watched a movie that has a sad ending? Right at the end, and maybe the, this, this, you know, a, a man and a woman, they're supposed to go off in the sunset and live happily ever after, and they don't? What do you think? Do you think, wow, what a great storyline. I'll watch it again. My wife sometimes has, has chosen us to watch things that have sad endings. And I tease her about it. Honey, you pick the ones with the worst endings. I'm, I'm on, the, on the edge of my seat. This is going to be good. And boom, everything just ends up in a horrible mess. We don't like that. But we don't. We want it to work out. We feel, ah. Life is good. We want the prince and princess to be happy ever after. We want a fairy tale ending, don't we? But you know, sometimes in life, life feels like there can be no fairy tale ending. Nothing that we can see can produce a good ending. You say, Pastor, I have been that, where, that place in life. Maybe right now you are. Pastor, where I'm at, I don't see any path where this ends up good. A place of finality. Can't you imagine Joseph being there? He goes in the new house with Potiphar. Here I am. The rest of my life I'll be right here. The rest of my life I'll be stuck here getting bread and working outside. The rest of my life a place of finality. Often when that comes I find that people become dejected and despair and destitute. It's a place of finality. You see, when we think God had, has sent us in the wrong direction, if we're not careful, our minds will imagine that this is a place of finality. Now, before I paint it too hopeless, just remember where this story ends. It's not a place of finality. Not only was it a place of finality, but it was a place of failure. It felt like a place of failure. Joseph did nothing to get to this point. Joseph did not follow his own GPS. Joseph did not sell himself to these traveling traders. Joseph did not make bad choices and now he was suffering consequences. Joseph just tried to do what he was supposed to do. In fact, the reason that Joseph uh, was, was hurt by his brothers and rejected by his brothers is because his father had sent him on a mission to go check on him. And if Joseph had been rebellious, he wouldn't have been down in Egypt now. But Joseph just did what he was supposed to do, and now he's a failure. You ever been that place in life where you're like, 
Lord, this was supposed to work out. I was doing right, and I feel like you kicked me in the teeth. Lord, I think I made the right decision, and I feel like, I'm not saying God did, but I feel like you just made a whole mess of things. A place of failure. No doubt, Joseph could not help but think back to his father. We find out later on in Genesis that when his brothers finally came, Joseph asked and diligently inquired about his family. He loved his family. I doubt there was a day that went by that Joseph did not think of his family and think of his home. And you cannot tell me that Joseph did not have some fleeting thoughts. I'll never see them again. A place of failure. I would say this, this also felt like a place of fear. Different culture, different people group, different citizens, a place of fear. Have you ever felt afraid? I read a story about a, a taxi cab driver who had a passenger, and the passenger wanted to get the taxi cab driver's attention and wanted to ask him a question, so he tapped him on the shoulder, and as he said, Sir, immediately the taxi cab driver screamed and uh, ran off the road and barely missed hitting another vehicle. Or standing where they're sitting there in the vehicle with a Heart's just beating 100 miles an hour. A taxi cab driver said, I am so sorry. This is my first day driving a taxi cab. For the last 25 years, I drove hearses. <laughs> fear. Fear doesn't always make sense. But fear is real, is it not? What you fear may not be what I fear. And we always laugh at someone else's fears. Well, those are silly. Uh, you, you're afraid of, of that? <laughs> that's, that? I can do that, but I'm afraid of this. You, you're afraid of water? Oh, that's, that's, I can swim all day, but I can't get on a ladder. I'm afraid of heights. Now, I am not afraid of heights, but I know people who are afraid of heights. I was just in grade school. My dad worked as a, uh, in a side job as a painting contractor. I was about 40 feet up on a ladder. Well, the ladder was a 40-foot ladder. I was on the next to top rung. I was painting uh, the, the flashing underneath a gutter. The face shield right in the gutter, and all of a sudden, a gust of wind grabbed the ladder and ripped it away from the house. 41, 42 feet up in the air. You say, Pastor, what did you do? Well, that's why my prayer life is really good to this day. No, the Lord helped me. I grabbed a gutter, grabbed my legs, twisted them around the ladder, and pulled myself back into the house. You say, Were well, you that strong? No, sir. God's that good. I would have rearranged my afternoon. Whatever reason, heights don't bother me, but they bother some people. They do, don't they? Some people are afraid of bugs, some of spiders. We all have different fears, but I have no doubt that the place of Egypt where God sent Joseph brought some new fear. Joseph wasn't in control any longer. Joseph could have been sent anywhere. Joseph didn't even have the freedom in his own life and the protections that he would have felt back with his family. And sometimes when we feel that God has sent us in the wrong direction, there will be new occasions for fear in our life. And we're tempted to say, God, what are you doing? God, where have you sent me? God, this place is final. This place is failing. And I'm full of fear. God, you have made a mistake. You see, Joseph was sent down to Egypt. God had a plan for Joseph, and it required Joseph being in Egypt. Because sometimes God causes us to go down so that he can bring us up. God brings us to a place so he can raise us up. And my friend today, if God has sent you to a place that doesn't make sense, on a journey that you didn't choose, to a place that you feel feel full of fear and failure and finality. Don't be deserted. Don't feel like you're dejected. And don't be destitute because God is still good. God is still in control. God is still on the throne. God is still among us during this time. Since January the 21st, like we mentioned this morning, this landscape of this country has changed in ways that we could never have predicted or imagined. If you had said to me back in February, well, Pastor, in the month of October, we will still be working through the COVID-19 pandemic, I would have said, no way, it's not even here yet. There's two cases. We just started the operation center, yet we have seen the landscape change. We have seen things, and it is, you are tempted to think that God is still not around. Maybe you've seen all of the memes on Facebook. I've seen a number of them. 
what will 2020 bring next? Most of them make me chuckle, right? From a pandemic to murder hornets to hurricanes and tropical storms. What will 2020 bring next? But God is still on the throne because this is what Joseph had in verse number two. You say, Pastor, is there hope? The answer is yes. In verse number two, we see this little phrase, and the Lord was with Joseph. You see, God had sent Joseph on a journey, but he didn't send him alone. God had sent him on a journey, but he didn't make him travel it all by himself. God had sent him on a journey, but he wasn't there without any help. And the Lord was with Joseph. You know, that theme is repeated throughout the scripture. That God is always near. That God is around us. He had, Joseph had divine accompaniment. He says in the New Testament, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Not only did he have divine accompaniment, he had divine assistance. The Bible says that whatever Joseph touched turned to gold. Now, the scripture says whatever he did prospered. Not only did it prosper, other people noticed it. You know what? When God gets involved, things have a way of prospering. When God touches a life, there's prosperous, there's prospering in that life. Problems will be easily smoothed over. Bills are handled. When God gets involved, boy, he makes, the Bible says, even our enemies to be at peace. You see, Joseph, though he felt he was sent in the wrong direction, was not sent there alone. What happens to you and to me is when we're in this place, we tend to think and we start to believe that we're in it all by ourselves. We've got to just muscle through it. I've got to just sit down and grin and bear it. Sometimes Christians will be in a spot and they'll say it like this. Well, this is my cross to bear. They kind of say it like that as well. I wonder how Joseph felt. But Joseph couldn't help but notice that whatever God, whatever God helped him, it prospered. Potiphar, his master, saw that. He said, wow. Whatever Joseph does, it, it turns into gold. And he started to put Joseph in charge of more things and more things until Joseph was second in command in Potiphar's house. The Bible says that God not only blessed Joseph, but he blessed the entire house in his fields, inside, outside. God's hand was just mighty and strong and blessing. Have you ever felt the blessing of God on your life? I have. Seeing God work in marvelous ways. Seeing God do amazing things. Remember when I graduated from college, throughout college, I worked a lot of hours to help pay my way through college. I had a friend once who went to his post office box there at the university and he had a note there that someone had put $10,000 on his school bill. Well, that's a good amount of money, boy, 20 years ago now, but even now it's a good, good amount of money. I take 10000 10, a day, wouldn't, wouldn't you? No, no chump change. I remember a fleeting thought in my mind, I've never got a $10,000 check. Still haven't got a $10,000 check. I mean, you can help change that. I'll, I'll preach it differently if you do. No problem. I gotta, I, I'll make a good illustration out of it, right? I promise you. But I remember those thoughts that we have as humans. I never got a $10,000 check. Is he that much better than me? Do we not think that? Come on, am I the only one here today? Yeah, Pastor, you are. You a rotten person. No doubt about that. No doubt about that. Do you know, when I graduated and I saw what God had done, I saw what I had owed to college and what I finished up with, and I said, wow, God, where did you bring $44,000 from? Where did you bring that? Because I for sure didn't make that. I for sure didn't have that. The hand of God. You see, sometimes God's blessing works in big and large ways like that. Other times, it's the subtle, simple things. You see God's hand at work. You see, Joseph, though he was sent, we think, in the wrong direction, yet God was with him. And he caused him to prosper. You know what? Anytime your word God sends you, then he is with you and he'll cause you to prosper. If he calls you to that place, if he sends you to that place, he will cause you to prosper. And at first, it may not feel like prospering. We know the end of the story with Joseph. We know how eventually he's going to go to jail for a crime he didn't commit. But then from jail, 
he catapults all of the other candidates for the second ruler in the country position. See, Joseph right now is in a job interview and he doesn't even know it. You know what Joseph was through all this whole time? Joseph was faithful. Where was Joseph sent? He was sent to Egypt. What did he have? All he had was God. What did he do? He was faithful. This morning, my friend, when you feel like God has sent you in the wrong direction, he hasn't. When you feel like God has left you alone, he hasn't. What should our response be? Be faithful. I believe God. I believe God. I found a little story about what God can do. The sign in the window read, Boy Wanted. And young John Simmons, though he was lazy, saw an opportunity and applied for it. He was quickly hired by the elderly Mr. Peters, and the place and the pace was leisurely, so he enjoyed the job. Toward the middle of the afternoon, however, he was sent up to the attic, a dingy place full of cobwebs and infested with mice. There, Mr. Peters said, you will find a long, deep box. Please sort out the contents and see what should be saved. Well, John Simmons was disappointed. It was a large container. There was nothing in there seen but old junk. After a few minutes, he went back to the ground floor and asked by the proprietor, Mr. Peters, if he had completed his work. He said, no, sir. It was dark and cold up there. I didn't think it was worth doing. And at closing time, he was paid and told not to return. The next morning, the old sign, Boy Wanted, appeared back in its usual place. And Crawford Hill was the next to be employed. He was asked to tidy at the shop and eventually sent upstairs in the middle of the afternoon to see the same box. However, Crawford Hill spent hours separating the usable nails and screws from the things to be discarded. And suddenly he raced down the stairs, all excited. Look what I found at the very bottom. He found a $20 bill. The store, though, had found the first conscientious boy who he could entrust his business. Years later, Mr. Peters said, This young man, Crawford, is now my successor. And he found his fortune in a junk box. But then he seemed to pause. He said, No, he actually found it in his mother's Bible. Because his mother taught him, He that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful in that which is much. When you feel like you've been sent in the wrong direction, and it's a place of fear and finality and failure. When you feel like you're all alone, though you're not, remember to be faithful. Because he that is faithful in that which is least, God says, will then be faithful in that which is much. Lord, I thank you for loving us today. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for us, Lord, and all that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful to you. I wonder if you're here this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm the only one looking around up here. And you would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. And you know what? I'm struggling with that. I feel like God has sent me in the wrong direction. It doesn't make sense to me. Would you pray for me that I'd remain faithful to God? That I'd remember His presence that is always with us? Pastor, would you pray for me? God touched me. Who would say that with an upraised hand this morning? Pastor, would you pray for me? And you pray this morning, amen, amen, hands all over, amen, 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 amen. I wonder if you're here this morning. And I wonder if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. I wonder if you're here today and you don't know that if you die, you'd go to heaven. But you can't know. Who would say, Pastor, wouldn't you pray for the others? Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Now, my friend, I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. Who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray for, some, for the other people? Just slip your hand up, slip back down. I'll see acknowledge you. We'll continue on. Who would say, that's me, Pastor. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Amen. I see that. Who else? Amen. I see that. Sometimes, as we understand what God has done, we know that God died for us. Jesus Christ died for us. 
The Bible says, but God commended. He showed his love toward us. And that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know that you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right, right where you're at. You may be here in the auditorium. You may be with us on live stream this morning. And thank you for those who joined us there. But there may be something in your heart right now that says, you know what? You need to trust Jesus Christ. You need to believe on Jesus Christ. You can do that right where you sit. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll help some people pray a simple prayer. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus Christ died for me, was buried and rose again. Please save me. I wonder this morning, the Lord's doing something in your heart. Would you trust in the day? You can pray that little prayer right where you're at. Now listen, the magic, there's no magic in what you say. When we believe, we believe with our heart. But I wonder if you're here this morning or online, you say, you know what, Pastor? I could pray that and mean that. I could trust Jesus right now. Well, wouldn't you do that, my friend? Would you pray the simple prayer and mean it from your heart? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. Would you pray, Lord, I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Tell him, he'll hear you. He was buried and rose again the third day. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. I wonder, my friend, if you're here this morning or if you're online, and you'd say, you know what, Pastor? I just prayed that and I meant that. I just asked Jesus to save me and I meant that. I'm not doing it because of someone else around me, but the Lord touched my heart. And Pastor, I, I've never prayed that before, but I just prayed that and I meant that. And as a testimony to that, would you slip your hand up? If you're online, there'll be a number on the screen. Would you send me a message? I'd love to send you a book. Who would say, Pastor, I just prayed that and I meant that. And I'd like you to rejoice with me. I meant that from my heart. Would you slip your hand up and I'll see that? Go on. I'll see that. Amen. Who else? I just prayed that and I meant that. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, for those who indicated they want to trust you, Lord, would they have trust you as your Savior today? For those who indicated that you touched their heart about when they feel like you've sent them on the wrong journey, Lord, would they remain faithful to you? Would you help them? In Jesus' name I ask, amen. As we stand to our feet with our heads down and eyes closed, if you want to come forward and pray, I'd encourage you to do that. There's folks at the front. If you want to have someone pray with you, if those who can talk to you, pray with you. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. Would you come now? Folks praying now. praying now as the Lord touched your heart you come now
Lord, thank you that we can trust you. Lord, thank you for being a good God. Thank you for all you have done. Lord, thank you that even though you send us sometimes on a journey that we don't understand, you're still with us. Lord, you still support us. You cause us to prosper. For all you've done, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.